Hello and welcome back. This is a general discussion about inputs and outputs from a robotics point of view. In general, inputs and outputs allow the robot to interact with its environment. The inputs allow the robot to see whether or not there are parts present or if there's something in the way that requires the robot to not move potentially. Outputs allow the robot to affect its environment to open and close tooling, grippers, initiate actions from other pieces of automation. For both inputs and outputs, there are two general types. One is digital, and that means that it is either on or it's off. There is no partially on or 30%. Analog, on the other hand, is a sliding scale. And so an example might be a digital thermal based input would say that you have exceeded a preset level, whereas an analog thermal input would say that it is 37 degrees or 92 degrees or 58 degrees. Generally speaking, outputs are most of the time digital. There are occasions where it might be analog. And just like with digital inputs and analog inputs, digital outputs are either on or off, whereas analog outputs are 7%, 30%, 5 milliamps, 15 volts, so on and so forth. Common functions for inputs will be things like minimum, maximum voltage levels, a physical switch, is there a part physically present? Magnetic fields usually are getting into proximity switches, is there a piece of metal in range of the switch? An electromechanical usually refer to things like limit switches, where there's a physical arm that is depressed and it then closes an electric signal. On the output side, an electromechanical device might be a relay. There are different types of input sensors. This is not the class to really get into them, but it's good for you to be aware of some of the types out there and some of the phrases you'll hear. Hall effect refer to sensors that work off a of magnetic field. A pressure transducer converts pressure to a variable voltage. Strain gauges are looking at electrical change due to deflection. Photoelectric or photo eyes are sensors that look for a break in the beam or the reflection of the beam back to the sensor. Think about the sensor on a garage door or at the entrance of a store. Outputs, like I mentioned earlier, we have analog and digital. Analog generally are going to be voltage or current, but from the point of robotics, generally the outputs are going to be tied to a relay or a valve. As far as valves for robotics are concerned, they generally have a solenoid, which is a coil and an electromagnet. They may or may not have a spring return. There are different configurations, as you can see on the screen here, and they come in various voltages. You will want to match the voltage of your valves and your solenoids to whatever your robot is configured for. Relay outputs are used when you are switching higher voltages with a lower voltage, or they can just be used to turn on and off voltages where you have higher current draws. The pictures on the left, the upper one is often referred to as an ice cube relay because they're more often than not clear and shaped like an ice cube. The unit at the bottom on the left is a motor starter. And really the only difference between something like an ice cube relay and a motor starter is the amount of current that they are designed to switch on and off. A motor starter is generally more robust and designed for the higher voltages and the higher currents that a motor half, one horse, two horse, and on up will tend to draw when they turned on and off. And then the schematics on the right show the different standard configurations that you might find for a relay. Once again, this is not the class to get into how they work, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of what is available. From the point of robotics, there are really four general categories that you will often see referred to. General purpose I.O. or GPIO can be used for whatever you want whether it's controlling a light or a valve or turning on and off signals to another robot. Robot I.O. generally are the inputs and outputs that are wired through the robot arm. A general purpose I.O. is going to be wired directly into the controller. The robot I.O. 
is designed so that you don't have to run wires up the side of the arm and have to worry about them getting caught or bending too much. Uh, the robot I.O. is wired inside of the arm and usually there is a connector near the end effector that will allow you to wire into those inputs and outputs. Safety I.O. is exactly what it sounds like. Things like emergency stops, uh, signals from safety devices such as light curtains or area sensors or pressure mats and then user interaction IOs generally get back to things like cycle start, cycle stop, hold, reset, anything where the operator would have to normally interact directly with the robot. There will often also be system level inputs and outputs. The e-stop is generally a dedicated circuit and there can be e-stops directly on the controller and directly on the teach pendant, but you can also have e-stop circuits in the robotic cell. Reset is often a dedicated system level input. Home is another example, as are some of the faults that you may run into. When working with outputs, you do have to worry about timing. The reason is that it takes a minimal amount of time for the input to be energized enough for it to respond. My experience with the robots in our lab at least are you normally want about a tenth of a second. You might be able to get away with something slightly less, but you do need some minimal amount of a pause when turning on the output to give that output a chance to activate and for the signal to build and get to wherever it needs to go. You normally want to use a timer or a wait statement to tell the robot to pause before it continues. When you're grabbing something with a gripper, this is especially important because you need to give the gripper a chance to move or create enough suction to actually hold on to the part. Inputs, from the robot's point of view, don't generally need any sort of timing. The timing is occurring at the other end, whatever is generating the signal. And you will normally want to loop your program to, say, wait for the specified input to become true. The exception to this would be if you are waiting for a part to be present, and even then you generally want to say, wait until a part is present before you start your program, but when you loop it, if there's a part already there, from a functional point of view, what happens is you don't really end up waiting. You see that it's there and the program will just continue. For the Mitsubishi controllers specifically, the command to access the outputs is M underscore out parenthesis, the output number, and then you set that equal to zero or one, zero being off, one being on. When we get back into the lab, physically, we have outputs four and five wired up on the controllers. If you are dealing with a simulation only, you can assign the outputs as you want to. If you are watching this and are not part of the class, it will be however you've wired up your robot. The inputs are accessed via M underscore IN, parenthesis, the input number and you're looking for it to be equal to a state of zero or one. You're not setting it. And as you can see on the screen, the robots in the lab here at the University of Memphis are wired to eight and nine. On our Mitsubishi robots, the grippers are referred to as hands and have been wired as such. And so you wanna turn on hand one, two, three, or four. H open for hand open will open up a hand H close will close the hand. And so depending on whether it is a suction cup or it is a mechanical gripper will really dictate whether or not you need to do hand open or hand close. It will also depend on how the air hoses have been plumbed for that specific robot. On the teach pendants, you would actually do hand plus six, five, four, or three in descending order to get to hands one, two, three, and four in ascending order. Yes, I know it's backwards. So here's an example of 
a simple program that will turn on and off the outputs and then wait for an input. And so, as you can see, it's moving through two points. It then turns on output 6000, waits for five seconds, then turns off output 6000. Normally, you don't want to wait for something as long as five seconds, but this example, it made sense. Maybe it is turning on a sealant applicator, or it could be pressing something together and needs to hold it. And so you can delay it for however long you need. If you're just picking something up, it would be hand open, delay, give it half a second or a second generally as a good rule of thumb. And then at line 40, it waits for input 6001 to be true before it begins its cycle over again and jumping to line 50 and going back up to line 10. Hopefully this has made some sense. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. That's all for now. Thanks.